Hello, my name is Janice B. Gordon. This is Scale Your Sales Podcast. Welcome to the Scale Your Sales Podcast, listed number nine of 42 best podcasts for every sales professional in 2021. I am Janice B. Gordon, the customer growth expert, recommended by LinkedIn as one of 15 innovative sales influencers to follow in 2021. In today's episode, we talk about the great resignation. And then we go on to talk about selling to high level, C level executives. You must understand one specific thing that they care about right now over and above what your competitors would say to them they're very busy people so how do you get on their radar and get time with them my next guest is managing director of executive sales coaching australia and is australia's leading authority in selling to c level listed in top sales world as the top 50 keynote speakers in 2020. Welcome to Scale Your Sales Podcast, Steve Hall. So welcome to Scale Your Sales Podcast, Steve Hall. Hey, how are you, Janice? Oh, it's really, really good to have you on. I've been following um, your, your wonderful commentary on LinkedIn. I do love it. You're very contrarian um, and, and no, devil's not. advocate. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's my nature, unfortunately. I'm one of those people that was born to notice differences. Some people notice similarities, some people notice differences. Yeah, and you celebrate those differences. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might as, might as well. Go, go with what you've got. Exactly, exactly. So, Tell me more, Steve, about the great resignation and how this affects sales. Well, as you know, people are talking a lot about the great resignation and how people around the world in all professions are um, reconsidering their their life and their career in the wake of COVID. And there are studies that say that, you know, up to 30, some say even 50 percent of people are considering leaving their jobs in the next uh, in the next year, Um, you know. And, and in sales, that's, that, that's a particular problem because we've always had a high turnover anyway. The average, um, the average tenure of a B2B salesperson is 18 months and of a B2B sales director or sales manager, it's less than that, 15 months. And it takes six, nine months for someone to ramp up and get, get effective. So it means that you know, the churn of salespeople is horrendous. And when a salesperson leaves, uh, you know, leave, leaves their role. They take knowledge, they take relationships, they take opportunities, they, they take a hip heat with them. So, you know, the effect of high sales turnover, if it gets worse, is going to be quite devastating for a lot of companies. Uh, so the question is, you know, what can we do to stop it or at least minimize it? And um, what can we do? Well, you know, my belief is that with sales needs to change dramatically. I think that in far too many particularly America, but even here in Australia, and, and I think, I suspect in England to some degree, um, there's the old-fashioned, oh, sales is a horrible game, you've just got to grit your teeth and go on with it, it's a numbers game, make the calls, reach the KPIs, and it's a high-pressure game where you've got, you've got to make your numbers, you've got to make your, you've got to um, make a lot of KPIs, and there's a, there seems to be an ethos that we can't trust salespeople to do the right thing unless we get on their backs and whip them. Uh, and who wants to live that way? You know, who wants, to, who wants to work in an environment where you're always scared for your job, where you've got someone on your back telling you to, 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 to make numbers that don't necessarily make sense? Um, so I think what we have to do is we have to change, I hate the word paradigm, it's a trendy word, but I'll, I'll use it, change the paradigm and think, okay, how can we make the job of selling easier and more enjoyable and yet still make our numbers? Um, and one way to do that is to trust salespeople, because I don't think any person goes to work in the morning wanting to do badly or not wanting to do a good job. There may be call reluctance, but let's say if there's call reluctance, let's make calling easier. Um, let's get the right type of people in the right type of role for the people making calls, the people who are good at making calls and enjoy it. Let's give them the support they need to make sure they're calling the right people. I think we need to look at the entire structure of how we do selling and 
change it so that it works for the people doing it as well as for the company as well as for the customers I, and I don't know about you, but I really think that the sales as a uh, process, uh, it doesn't work for the customer. And, and you're yeah. right, it doesn't often work for the people that are having to do it as well. So it means that there's something fundamentally wrong and it's broken. And we really need to look at ways of fixing it. And I think there's a few things that happened that you've just mentioned. One is COVID. We're all virtual working from home. And then the other thing is that there's been lots of research that the sales, the job of sales is going to be taken over by automation. I think a lot of that's rubbish, but there is that's happening in all industries where, you know, machines are taking over for the, the more mundane jobs, which is great. Well, he, we, that's what we want. We want to do the interesting things, really. We want to have the thought leaders and the, the consultants that do all of those kind of more nuanced um, things. So I think already there's always been a drive for the, the kind of lower uh, level jobs are going uh, because of, of technology. But you're right, there isn't, uh, there is a, um, you know, something wrong with the process if traditionally there's a high turnover. That tells you there is something wrong with the process. Absolutely. And you mentioned technology and technology can be great, but it can also be misused. Um, and I think at the moment, a lot of people are using sales technology to do the wrong thing faster and more of it. Um, you know, I'm a, I've, got, I've got a big problem with um, sales cadences and um, the cadence of emails. You know, you say, okay, you, 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 you know, what we, as I think I mentioned, we're trying to use automation like an electronic sheepdog to herd her sheep, um, customer sheep through a gate. And that's not how human beings work. Um, you know, if, if you put together a cadence of 12 emails designed to nudge a customer in, a, in an order, what it means is they're getting 12 times as many emails. And that wouldn't be as bad if, if you were the only person doing that. But if everyone does that, they're getting 12 times a thousand email, more emails. Mm -hmm. So what do you, you know, what, how many emails a day do you get? I, but the first thing I do in the morning is I delete about 100 emails without reading them. Um, so there's a little bit... You know, it, if you're using technology to send more emails, to make more dials, to do the wrong thing faster, you're using it the wrong way. And technology can be wonderful. You can use it for research, you can, you can use it for a lot of things, but we're using it for the wrong things. So I, I, I don't know about you, I think that the, the way to start changing things is to start with the end in mind. What are the outcomes that we want to achieve and work backwards from that? And I don't think it's about sales and sales organisations. I think it's all about the buyers and the customers. And yeah, absolutely. they're already um, in control of their process. And we're... Well, that's, that's, that's debatable. <laughs> Well, in terms of they're the ones that are making the decisions. They either say yeah. yes or they no. They say no. Um, they may not even understand their own process because some of it's so complicated. But nevertheless, they they are the decision makers. It's not the sellers. It's the buyers. Yeah. So if we start with that, what happens then? If we start with that, what what would you say is the way to kind of like work, rework our system to fix it? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. It starts with the customers. And, and the, uh, the, you said start with the end in mind. The end in mind should be to help the people that become your customers succeed in getting whatever it is that they want that you can help them with. So the, the first question is, which we're talking B2B, which companies need what I sell? And I don't necessarily mean a widget or a piece of software, but the result that you know, the sizzle, the result that that widget gets them. Um, so one of the key things is, is to, to select the right targets. One of the reasons that we want to make 50 or 100 dials a day is we don't know who we're targeting. We're dialing a heap of people and we're using the act of calling them or emailing them to get them to identify themselves as targets. And that's disrespectful to the customers because it means that, you know, for every, if you make 100 calls and you get, um, you know, 50, uh, 10 answers and you have five conversations you get one lead then you've called 99 people that didn't want what you're selling uh, at least they didn't want it now or else you or else you call them badly whether it's a call or an email or a social marketing or everything so the first thing to do is let's target the right customers and be more thoughtful about which customers 
we need what we sell, which means we need to know what we sell. In other words, what result do we provide to them that they want? And the result that a mining company wants might be different to the result that a bank wants or a pharmaceutical company. And the result that a CEO wants might be different to the result the head of manufacturing wants. So we've got to understand the customers better from a perspective of their role, their industry, their company, and their current situation. And that's the start. Of, that's the start. Uh, and it means we'd be, we'd be doing less. We, we'd be doing less, but we're doing it much more effectively to the right people for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I remember um, I, you were talking about personas, marketing personas. And although it's a step in the right direction, it it's actually doesn't go far enough. So explain that um, to me. Well, look, marketing personas are a, are a step in the right direction. It's much better to try and target a marketing director, for instance, than to target someone generically, because what a marketing director calls or cares about is different to what a, um, you know, someone the head of customer service cares about. Um, even though they should be working towards the same overall corporate goals, but the way that they do it is different. Um, so that's a step in the right direction. But the fact is that not all marketing directors care about the same thing, depending on the industry they're in and the company they're in and the state of that particular company, they might be in growth phase, they might be in um, hot, st steady phase, they might be closed down because of COVID. So it's it's a degree of one, it's it's worse than, it's better than the one size fits all of a simple value proposition, of a simple value proposition. And I've always, I've always said that one size all fits all doesn't work for socks. And if it doesn't work for socks, how can it work for anything else? Well, that's like, that's sort of like, having orange socks, you know? It's a little bit better because you eliminate the people that don't want orange socks, but still pretty much one size fits all. Um, and if you're, look, if, if you're selling to an audience, if you've got 8,000, 100,000 potential company, companies that could potentially buy what, buy what you sell, then maybe you can do it because you've, you've got a market to a lot of people. But if you're targeting a lower number of companies that, are, that winning one of them is worth, you know, six figures plus, then you should put in the research to do more than just do a persona, but to look at the person, because you're a, you're, you're a sales consultant, I'm a sales consultant, yet we're very different, we're in different countries, we focus on different things, we've got different beliefs, and the ways to target you and me, wouldn't a, a, a persona of a sales consultant, I don't think would work for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell me more about your your real, ex well, you've got lots of expertise, but there's one area that you talk about uh, a, a lot, which is selling to the C-suite. So help us to understand, you know, about understanding the C-suite and, and why it would be different to targeting other levels. Okay, well, I, I call it a sea level because I, that's my the, the, the background. There's my metaphor for sea level. It's a very bad joke, but um, look, in some ways they're just people. Um, in, in some ways, a person is a person is a person. But obviously, you need certain characteristics to get to the top, and you've got certain responsibilities. So, you know, what would interest? They, they are they are more removed from the day to day. Um, their focus is uh, it, it, it tends to be broader. Um, they're very, very busy. I mean, everyone's busy, but from a C-level perspective, if you're a CEO, a CFO, someone in, in the C-suite, you've got a certain number of things you care about. Uh, you care about your company, you care about your board, uh, or your shareholders, your customers, you care about your, um, your, your, uh, your, empl your direct reports, your employees, you care about risk. There's a whole heap of things you care about. And then you care about... Um, um, the tax department and the government and government policy and, and those things. And then after, after all those things and people they care about, right at the bottom is people trying to sell them stuff. And right at the bottom in that tiny space for people trying to sell me stuff, there's an awful lot of people in that space. So when you're selling to people at the top, you've got to say, say to yourself, why would someone who's got very limited time and very limited attention want to talk to me compared to, and want to let me do discovery and ask intrusive questions compared to the 8,000 other people that, that, that want to do the same thing. And why should they give me a tiny slice of the valuable time when everyone else is after their time? So in the very first phase, when you're trying to speak to a, anyone, but particularly someone at the C-suite, the question is, why should the, the, your competitor, anybody else that wants a slice of their time? So the question is, how do I stand out? Now, the good thing about people at the top is they're easier to find. 
you know, finding the IT, IT infrastructure manager is a lot more difficult than finding the CEO. And finding what they care about is a lot, lot easier because particularly for a public company, they tell you in their annual reports and their 10Ks if they're American companies or 20Fs if they're foreign companies on the SEC um, or in the SEC. Um, and they tend to talk to the press. So you can normally work out a reasonable degree of what they care about. So if I'm, I'm doing research for one of my clients at the moment, and I'm looking at companies, and I'm trying to find out what it is they care about that my customer can help them with. I'm working backwards. And it's what they care about now. You know, and it, there's, you know, there's, there's, the, you, there's the typical things, and the, there's profit, and there's revenue, and there's costs. And it's great to target them than not target anything. But again, it's a bit generic because anyone that's targeting the sea level is talking about that. Whereas if you can say, oh, look, oh, in, in your annual report, you've said that you've got a, an initiative to reduce greenhouse gases. And I've, I've, got, I've got something that can help you, uh, help you with working out what the greenhouse gases are across your different, um, across your different organizations. Then you've got a much better chance of talking about something they care about and of getting through to them in the first place rather than all those other people who are just saying, I can help you reduce costs. Mm -hmm. I and why is it, given that compared to 10 years ago, there is so much information out there available on social media? Um, it's even if it's not a CEO, then you can find out a lot more information anyway across the board. Um, with, with LinkedIn, you're probably connected to someone that's in the company that you're trying to target. Why is it that salespeople are not very good? doing that research well first of all i question whether salespeople should do that research mm -hmm. um it depends on the circumstances we've tried we talked we talked about the old ways but you know we've, you've got this current situation where sdrs are all the rage you've got someone that you've got someone that takes the makes the calls or does, does the connection because the salesperson's far too big and important to do it themselves and I, I don't like that model at all because if you're a senior executive do you want to you know a 12 year old sdr calling you up trying to qualify you you know you probably want someone you can talk to about business business issues um so I think research is important, but if you're genuinely trying to get the right people to do the right job that they enjoy, then find, if, you're, if you're a reasonable sized company, find someone that's good at research and get them to do the research. Mm -hmm. And if and so, someone said to me the other day, I'm, I was mouthing off about SDRs of, you know, a, a, a sin. And someone said, yeah, but how do you get, how do you get training salespeople up to scratch? And I said, well, you shouldn't be getting them to train on your, on your prospects. But you can certainly get them to do research for you and, and, to, and to find out who's who. Yeah. So that's one task that can be hived off to someone that's good at it. Get a university student to do it as a project, get, you know, you know, outsource it. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, one reason they're not good at research is because they're under the pump to make the calls. And people say, our oh, salespeople shouldn't do research because it takes them, stops, it gets them off the phone and it gets them away from doing emails. Well, hey, good, you know? Well, as you said, you can make a lot of calls to the wrong people. If you did the research, you probably only need one or two as opposed to 100 or 200 as, as well. That's so right. Well, I've, you... I've, I've, so I was going to say, I've got a friend who runs a, a, an outsourced um, demand generation company and he, his people make, have got to make an average of 15 contacts a day, not a not, not, not hundred, because they take the time to have a strategy to work out what the what the business issues that their customers can face, can, can solve, and then understand them in, in a fair degree of depth. The people he has making calls are mainly retired salespeople in their you know, 60s and 70s who can talk business to the, to the, the, the people they're told. They still call it a lower level than sea level usually, but um, you know, that's a much more uh, relaxed, nurturing uh, type of call. And the other thing, of course, is that um, we're all looking for people that want something now. So we're not, you know, we, 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 there are people who won't, there are ex, kind of executives who won't talk to anyone who's not already a qualified lead that's looking right now. But what they forget is there's a huge heap of stuff that happens before you become a lead, before you're looking there. Only, I think, in between 1% and 3% is looking for your specific solution right now. But a much greater percentage is looking for the results that your solution gives. They just haven't thought about using your solution to get those results. So... You need to change not just the way you're calling, but the type of things you're, and the people you're calling, but the type of thing, things you're calling about. Mm. Yeah, you've, you've mentioned a lot about calling. 
what about your what's your view on social selling as a strategy for lead generation well unfortunately linkedin and other things have become filled with spam i mean how many how many offers do you get a day for um it management or or those erp systems or people that can help you get leads or whatever it's via linkedin yeah. um and look there was I'm not one to knock out any any particular tool. I, my focus is this. Here's a, here's a company I want to get into. I think that they've got a business problem that I can solve. So I need to get to the need to get to the right people. Who are the right people? Maybe it's the CFO and the head of accounts. I, you know, it depends what depends what I sell and what the result is. So the question is, what's the best way to get to that person? And you've got a number of options. You've got the phone. You've got you've got LinkedIn. You've got social selling whatever that is you've got referrals which just referrals are still by far the best way to get there so what linkedin is great for is if you see someone on linkedin and you see that you know someone that knows them that's a great way to get a referral assuming the person you know trusts you enough to give you a referral so i won't refer anybody to anybody I, I'm, I'm only going to refer someone i know this isn't going to make me look like an idiot and the person doing the referring is going to be trusted by the person they're referring them to. Because if someone I don't know refers me someone to me, I'm less likely to talk to them, right? So referrals are brilliant if you can get the right sort of referral. And we tend to think of referrals as going to one of your customers and saying, who else do you know I can sell stuff to? Whereas I think of them as looking at people and saying, who do I know or who does someone in my organization know that knows them well enough and trusts and is trusted enough to say, hey, you should talk to this guy. So, so social selling has a place, but by itself, it's just another tool. And in some ways, it's an ineffective tool because the, the, one of the reasons I like the phone, is, and, and again, the phone's just another tool, but one of the reasons I like the phone is you get feedback. You call them up and you get onto an executive assistant or you get onto the person themselves and they say, I'm not even slightly interested to be bought one yesterday. Okay, it's a bummer, but at least you know quickly. Whereas with, you, could, you could be using social selling on that person for a year and get no, no response whatsoever. Mm. You send people an email, no response. You send them another email in your cadence of 8 million emails and you get no response. What does that mean? Didn't they get it? Aren't they interested? Did they leave the company? Who knows? So mm. then, you know, so I, I, I tend to talk about calling because that's, I, I think it's, it, it's people still like to talk if, if, you, if you do it right. Um, and because you do get that immediate feedback of yes or you know, if not yes or no, but interested or, or mm. yeah. And you met, you mentioned that you know perhaps three percent, three to five percent of people are actually ready to buy now, and there's a greater number that are maybe ready in six months, a year, maybe six years. So there's you've got to nurture people and build a relationship. So the one thing that social selling does is that you're able to target the right people and, and continue to stay on their radar and, and, and build the relationship um, that maybe email won't get through, um, wh whereas um, social connections, you know, will often enable you to do that. You're right, but the same does apply to the phone. Um, and I think it's a combination of the two. C certainly you can connect with people on LinkedIn, build some rapport, talk to them. And, and, but it's not, it, that's really socializing. You know, if you're just on to someone to get them to buy stuff from you, I mean, an awful lot of my connections on LinkedIn have, have connected with me. I like to think they've connected with me for my erudite wit and charm and good looks, but you know, some of them definitely want to try and sell me stuff and they're never going to sell me stuff because I'm a one person company and I don't need the stuff they sell. Yeah. Um, if you're getting, if you're trying to connect with someone purely to sell them, I think that's going to be a problem. I want someone on LinkedIn once said, you should only ever connect with people on LinkedIn who are potential customers. And I said, great. Why should they connect with you? <laughs> you're not their potential customer. No. So, <laughs> so yes yeah, social selling you can certainly do that on social selling yeah. uh, but you can do it in other ways too and, and yeah. you should probably do it in, in all the ways that you can yeah 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 so let's switch it up a little bit and talk about the industry 
Um, one of my pet subjects is talking about the diversity of industry, making sure that it's, you know, a healthy, diverse community of people that uh, are able to stand in the shoes of their customers, to understand their customers' needs really well. And if you have a homogenous group and you're talking to a global community, that isn't always the case. Um, so what is your, your view and experience of diversity? What's, what's, what do you think has progressed or, or not, as the case may be? Well, here in Australia, we have a a more even ethnic mix if we're talking ethnic ethnicity so we've you know we've, we've got we haven't got one apart from poms or, or descendants of poms we haven't got one dominant ethnicity and, and that's been really good because you know you'll go into an office and there's a huge mixture of people so i think that's that's a massive benefit um we still there's there's still a, a tendency i think of um white middle-aged men to hire other white middle-aged or young men because they people tend to hire who are like them and I think that's a big mistake um, I, I, I believe that um, the more diversity you've got diversity of <laughs> diversity of sex there's not that many sexes diversity of sex diversity of ethnicities diversity of viewpoints diversity of talents and skills the better it is um, I was talking to I don't know if you know Fred Copestake I was talking to him yes, yesterday very well um, I'll go, and I was saying um, you know, one, one analogy for a company or for a sales team is that, um, you know, you, you, you look at Mission Impossible um, and the teams that oh, they get on Mission Impossible and the, the, there's, always, there's always someone that's good with the radio and someone that's good at breaking in windows and picking locks and someone that's good at running away and shooting people. And, in, you know, you don't see a bunch of you know, 45 year old white men doing doing that it's all it's all it's all, all it, they're all the effective teams are built of interlocking pieces that are different. So I believe that diversity is important. I believe we have a long way to go to achieve it. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of unconscious and conscious prejudices here in Australia, certainly in the USA and certainly in the UK. Mm, yeah, yeah. And in other countries too, but they're the ones I have the most experience of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're on a desert island on your own, what would be the one thing you would take with you, Steve? Well, assuming I had food and alcohol and um, and things like that, I would take my iPod. I love my and music. Take your my iPod. Your iPod. Why? I just love music. Um, and I don't, I don't get to listen to it that often. I only listen to it in two places: uh, driving and in the gym. Um, because I like to be doing things when I'm listening. And uh, of course, I haven't been doing a lot of driving because we've been locked down, and I haven't been going to the gym. So I've been missing. I've been missing my iPod. But I do. I do love it, and I do. Uh, I do enjoy exercising or driving or just doing things with music in my ears well i'm sure you'll have a lot to do on your desert island because actually you have to find your food and water and shelter and build it so you'll probably need a, a copious amount of not only alcohol but certainly music to keep you going well i've been with, with my i only watch one reality tv show and that's survivor so uh all oh, right yeah your yeah. quid's in <laughs> So, but, Steve, uh, how can listeners get hold of you? Oh, the simplest way is my LinkedIn. Is LinkedIn, and my profile is very similar. It's Steve Hall Sydney. It's also my Twitter feed, but that's sort of full of left-wing political ranting, so I wouldn't go there. Um, so, um, yeah, Steve Hall Sydney on LinkedIn, and all my connection details are there. Excellent. I'll put everything in the, the show notes. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I would urge listeners to follow you on LinkedIn because you're always good for the more unusual talking about the differences and, and things. Um, so thank you for being a guest on Scale Your Sales podcast, Steve Hall. It was very much my pleasure, Janice. Thank you for asking me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Scale Your Sales podcast. If you like this discussion, feel free to listen to other episodes or watch the caption show on YouTube and subscribe to future episodes. I would really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you.